Well, uh, today, um, th- there's nothing big going on, okay? Just uh, let you know, okay? No, uh, do what now? I don't mean to freak you out. <laughs> don't mean to freak you out. This is not a, uh, this is not one of those days where somebody's leaving, okay? It's not a day where there's uh, anything going on. Just one of those days where I did want to not uh, live stream the next three weeks, okay? Uh, and the reason why is because I just wanted to have kind of maybe pull up around the kitchen table as a church, okay? We have maybe, I think last week's message, for instance, maybe like 175 views, okay? So I just want these next three weeks to be kind of in-house, just us talking like we were. We're talking maybe around a kitchen table, if you will. We can shrink the room like that, pull up a chair around the table, and just talk about uh, a few things that we need to talk about as a church. Okay, uh, And there, there are a few things to talk about. So I didn't want to just uh, talk about these with everyone, with every, in a, in a public, uh, for public consumption, okay, in that particular way. All right. let, me, let me start off by asking you this question. Uh, what do you think is the greatest obstacle facing Bartlett Hills? What do you think is the greatest obstacle facing Bartlett Hills? You may say, okay, well, uh, it could be the roof, right? could be the roof. Uh, you know, at least we're in a 20-year-old building and we got building issues, or it could be the parking lot, or it could be maybe a, a lack of resources, or maybe lack of attendance, or uh, laziness, or apathy, or things along those lines. But, but I want to bring in something that uh, trumps those. Attitude. That's our biggest hindrance right now. Unity. That's our biggest hindrance right now. So you say, okay, Elliot, so, so what happened that you're preaching on this this morning? N- nothing specific happened. In fact, the Lord gave me this message, this idea to preach this last December when I got away. But just giving the freedom to preach it church-wide right here, right now. And so, you know, you may be thinking in this message, you know, do you have somebody specific in mind? I tell you, honestly, when I preach this message, I don't have any specific person that I'm picturing in my brain. And that the culture of our church, overall, the culture of our church has a good attitude. The culture of our church overall is unified. But there is a subculture. There is a subculture that runs pretty deep, runs pretty strong, runs pretty quick. That subculture has a negative attitude. That subculture is divided. And as that subculture gains more ground, that subculture culture will become our culture. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And so we're talking about attitude and unity today. And what I don't want you to do is simply this. I don't want you to think, oh, yeah, it must be the other person. Oh, yeah, she really needs to hear this. Oh, yeah, he really needs to hear this. You know? Uh, what I want us all to do, and I've already done this for myself. Honestly, Lord, are these characteristics, is, is this attitude that we're talking about today from Philippians chapter 2? Lord, is there something in, within me that needs to come to you? Is there something within me that I need to repent of? Lord, what attitudes do I need to change? Lord, in what ways can I bring unity more to Bartlett Hills as the pastor? And I want you to ask those same questions as a church member. I don't want you to kick it off to someone else. I would love for you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you today about this topic. And I'm not trying to talk you into anything, because I know if I just try to talk you into something, you'll hop out in the hallways and somebody will say, well, that's not us. And you'll say, yeah, that's right. And somebody will just talk you right out, right out of it. But I do 
and have been praying that the Lord would do a work in your heart, work in my heart today, especially if you're part of that subculture, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life today and that you would turn away from particular attitudes that we're going to talk about today. So today, in this series, it's called Church Killers. I tried to soften that up. I thought it was a little bit drastic. I said, whoa, Joe, former police officer, head of security here at Bartlett Hills, is this too, you know, to the point? I said, Denise, what do you think about this? Is this too much to the point? But I have no other way to really put it. Because if this attitude lingers on and divisions linger on, it will eventually kill Bartlett Hills. Did you know it? Because the Spirit will say, hey, I can go somewhere else. Even if we had a thousand people in here and the attitude was still there in the subculture, Bartlett Hills would still be dead. It would still be a very self-centered church in that particular way in the subculture. It would still have those attitudes. It would still be divided. And so we all love our church. Amen? We don't want to be a church killer. I want to invite you, church member, not to be a church killer. Not to be the one that it's all said, when it's all said and done, the look back to Bartlett Hills and your attitude is pointed out as the attitude that kills Bartlett Hills. Or the division that your attitude brings is pointed to and said, yep, that was the one that really killed it. Some feel that unity in the local church is not a reality because they've never truly experienced that in a local church before. True unity in a local church. You've been there and things are harmonious. And so therefore, some think, you know, it's a pipe dream that's never going to happen. Why really strive for unity in the local church? Baptists are really good at bickering and kind of going back and forth with each other in a certain respect, not to pick on us, but I am one of us, so I can pick on us, you know what I'm saying? And we're kind of good at that. So we say, hey, that's just how it is. That's how we're going to keep rolling on. And you may be asking, well, what harm could one bullet do? I'm just one person. If my attitude is not so great, ah, you know, I'm just one person. You understand, obviously, that one bullet could be fatal. Just one church member, one attitude could be that final bullet that lodges right next to your heart. Takes you out. A strategically placed bullet is fatal. You say, well, who's shooting the bullets? Well, you know we're in a spiritual warfare. And I don't want you to be used of Satan to be a bullet. To put a bullet strategically in Bartlett Hills. So let's talk about some church killers. From Philippians chapter 2 is where we are. If you want to go there, familiar chapter to us. Church killer number one. The pretender. The pretender. If you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, for being united with Christ, let me ask you a very basic, simple question. Are you saved? Church member, are you saved? Church member, do you know Jesus? Have you come face to face with him? Have you repented of your sins? Have you placed your faith in him alone for salvation? Are you truly saved? That's at the very foundation of unity in a church. And so I asked the question that I've asked before, how can you live a life of unity at church or in your home or at work or anywhere you go? How can you live a life of unity at church when you have not been united with Christ? And some of us are trying to play that game where we've been in church our entire lives, but we've never truly been saved. And we're wondering why we can't get along with anybody. I want to invite you to go back to that very basic question and to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. If you 
you are truly one of his. As the passage goes on, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship from, with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, second question that I must ask you is, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Church member, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? That you can know Jesus Christ and be saved but not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Did you know that? Question for you, how can you live a life of fellowship at church or at home or at work when you are out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit? If you're out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit and you are disobeying him and fighting against him and you have no real fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning that he has control over your life that you have surrendered your attitudes over to him, that you will be in conflict with him, and you'll be an unhappy person. You'll be a joyless person. Did you know? You'll be that type of person because you'll be fighting the Holy Spirit all the time, and that will bleed over into your attitudes. That'll bleed over into your relationships. That'll bleed over into the unity of the body here if you're not in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So are you saved? Are you full of the Holy Spirit? If you're not, then you can be. This morning, you can be. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, and, and look at these fruits. Look, look at these, the fruit of the Spirit. And see how they're exactly opposite to the negative attitude and division. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So individually, as church members, if we are living full of the Holy Spirit, these qualities will be in your life. That's a telltale sign whether you are living and operating and walking and relating full of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does that describe you? Does that describe how you relate? One bullet can be fatal. How can this one bullet be fatal? Well, let me say this. If you have a, in a church... If you have a non-believer or a believer who's not filled with the Holy Spirit, gain influence. And people look to these, this particular person or group of people to see how this Christian life is lived, to see how we should treat each other within a church, within a body. They may think, this is the way it should go. Maybe this bad attitude is the way I get heard. Maybe this bad attitude is how I get things done around here. And you could fall in line with the wrong crowd. So some don't want unity. They're not, they're not so concerned with unity in the church. Why? Because they're motivated by drama. They wouldn't know their life without drama if that drama wasn't there. They're motivated by getting their own way. They're motivated by stirring the pot. Are you saying this is our culture at Barley Hills? No, but I'm saying we have a strong subculture. We have a strong subculture that is about this. It's about drama, getting their own way, and stirring the pot. Do you see it? Do you see it? Church killer number two, being divisive. Philippians 2, verse 2, before we get to that, let me just say it's, it, it's a well-known military strategy. Divide and conquer. Like I said before, you understand that we are in spiritual warfare. You understand when the comeback of Bartlett Hills that Satan is not happy with that. He doesn't want to see Bartlett Hills get on fire for Jesus. He doesn't want to see Bartlett Hills become united. He doesn't want that. He wants the subculture to keep rolling. 
He wants the divisive, bad attitude subculture to keep rolling in Bartlett Hills so he can divide and he can conquer. Maybe Satan may be working this way, and he'll divide uh, the old and the young, maybe pit them against each other. Or the modern and the traditional, maybe he'll pit those people together. Different groups. Wherever Satan can find divisions where he can divide people out, divide groups out, and start to pick them off one by one, and giving them a bad attitude and causing more division, he'll just sit back and not have to worry about Bartlett Hills at all. Don't you see the strategy that's in place? I hope you're not one who is being divided out. I hope you're not one that's being conquered in this particular area. In verse 2, Paul says, did make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. So Paul's saying, make my joy complete. Here's how this happens, by being like-minded, by being unified in your mind. Not that we're all the same. Not that we have to see every issue exactly the same. But overall, we are like-minded with the mind of Christ. That we have the same love. Because the love of Jesus Christ is in our heart, it shows up in our relationships. And we have the same love for each other, that we are one in spirit. That with all of our differences that we have, and there are many, no two of us in the room, even husbands and wives, would see everything exactly the same. We're all from different backgrounds and different, a lot of things. But being one in spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who unites us. That can overcome any of those differences and must, and being one in purpose. That's what makes Paul's joy complete. And I'll tell you this too, that's what's going to make your joy complete. That's what may be missing in your life. That, that may be why Bartlett Hills is a friendly church, but it's not especially a joyful church. It's the friendliest church in North America, but it's not especially joyful. It could be because we're not like-minded. We're not having the same love, one spirit of one purpose. One bullet can be fatal. If it gets put and lies in the right spot. Church killers, the self-ambitious, in verse 3, simply says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Let me ask you, what motivates you to do what you do? What motivates you to do what you do? What motivates you to say what you say? What motivates that attitude that you have? What, what, motiv what, what makes you tick? What makes you go? What motivates you? A lot of us are motivated by our own selfish ambition. And for some, the only motivating factor is themselves and what they want and it shows up in their attitude, and it brings divisiveness to a body. It brings division to a body, the church. Because you were never meant to live for yourself. You were never meant to live for yourself as a believer. If you're a non-believer, go ahead and live for yourself, because that's who you're going to live for anyway. As a believer, we live for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory and for his kingdom and for what he wants. But if you're not saved or you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll continue to live for yourself, and that'll be the motivating factor in everything that you do, including your relationships here at church. For some, the only motivating factor is to gain or keep their influence or their power or to get their own way. And every decision and attitude that they have is all banked on that and into the means of that, to keep their power, to keep their influence, and above all, I'm going to get my own way. That's an ungodly attitude that needs to get eradicated from Bartlett Hills. Or Bartlett Hills will just be right here spiritually for how long? Forever, until that attitude goes away. God can't use a church that's motivated by itself. It's in it for its own glory. God cannot and will not use that type of believer nor a church. 
It will kill Bartlett Hills. Some feel that they need to voice their every opinion and that their every opinion must be put into practice. And if it's not put into practice, I'm going to whine about it. I'm going to complain about it. That's a selfish attitude. It has no place in the church. It has no place in the life of a believer that is filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want to be a lobbyist, go to Washington. God knows they need some more, right? If you want to go lobby, go, to, go make yourself a sign, get a magic marker, and go cruise around Washington and lobby, 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 lobby. But that's not the church. The church is not the place for your lobbying. The church is a place for you to come and serve Jesus Christ and advance the kingdom. One bullet can be really fatal. It just takes one bullet. It just takes one attitude. The acts of the sinful nature, this is before, the passage right before it speaks of the, Holy, of the, the fruit, fruit of the Spirit. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. You may be thinking selfish ambition is no big deal. We live in America, right? Selfish ambition is what keeps us going. Look how the Lord sees it and what sins selfish ambition is lumped in with. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. And right there in the middle of all those, selfish ambition. Don't you see how wicked the Lord sees it when you live for yourself? Dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa, 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 now, like, what are you saying? That if I've ever been drunk before, I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If I've ever been jealous before, I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If I've ever had a fit of rage before, I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If I have been selfishly ambitious, I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Is that what this passage is saying? No. This passage is not saying because you did this, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What this is, passage is saying is, if this is your lifestyle, and this is who you are, and this is how you roll and live your life, that is evidence that you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ before, that your heart has never been changed, or you would live a different way in the overall of who you are. Does that make sense? But the reason I put this passage up there was just for you to see that selfish ambition is right in the middle of some ugly stuff. And it's right in the middle of some ugly stuff and some wicked stuff because it is ugly and it is wicked and it is evil. Church killer. And conceited. In verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Let's just define humility like this, one who sees himself as God sees them, one who is totally dependent upon God for everything that they have. Maybe we'll use that definition of humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. So we, this passage that I read you just then, with the list of those 25 different sins and selfish ambition is right in the middle of it. The next passage is this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see the difference, right? You see the difference in, once again, in these two lifestyles. And if you're living in the former passage here at church, it's going to overflow in your relationships, and it's not going to be pretty at all. If you live this way with the fruit of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, living through you, and that goes into your relationships here in church. It's going to be a beautiful thing. It's going to be a beautiful place to be. Galatians 5.24, the passage after the fruit of the Spirit, as it, that continues, those who belong to Christ Jesus 
have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Which means when you get out of step with the Holy Spirit, and you are living a life that is not filled with the Holy Spirit, your automatic default setting is I'm going to be a conceited person. I'm going to be all about myself. That's your default setting. That's your natural setting for all of us. That's your natural, that's our natural setting. So you need to live the supernatural life full of the Holy Spirit, not, your nat- not the natural life full of your bad attitude and your conceitedness, provoking and envying each other. Some value their own opinion and preferences too highly. They're conceited in that particular way. Some value their own opinion and preferences too highly and feel that their opinions and preferences must be put into practice or into play, or they just pitch a fit. Why is that? Just because you're, you have vain conceit rolling through you. You're just concerned about yourself. You can't quit looking in the mirror, Mr. Primper, you know? You just can't quit looking in the mirror and thinking this life is all about you. But you know what makes a monkey out of yourself when you do that? Everybody sees that but you. You can't get your eyes off yourself when you think this life is all about you. You're just making a monkey of yourself. You're just the only one who doesn't see it. But people with spiritual eyes see it. They're like, man, that's who she thinks she is. Man, who's he think she is? They ain't conceited. It's like, when you go, when, maybe when you're in the toy store, sometimes it's as good to go down the toy aisle just to relive your childhood and wonder, what in the world are these toys today, right? You know what I'm saying? Back in the day, when you were a kid, it seemed like things were so much better. But you're walking down a toy aisle, like maybe in a store, you're cruising by, and you see a mom and a kid on the toy aisle. And this kid sees the toy that he wants. So Junior Men's birthday is in two weeks, and so the mom says, you know, no, I'm not going to buy you this toy right now. Your birthday's in two weeks there, Junior Mint. And so Junior Mint gets all crazy and starts, like, hollering and screaming and, like, wailing around on the floor, like pitching a fit. Like, hey, Junior Mint, get up. Get up, Junior Mint. Quit being a little baby. Don't you know, Junior Mint, you look ridiculous down there on the floor? All the while, all the while, Junior Mint thinks he's going to get his way. Junior Mint thinks this is the way he gets his way. This is how I get what I want. Junior Mint's thinking, I'll just roll around on the floor and pitch a fit. And I'll scream so loud, and I'll embarrass my mom, and I'll scream, and I'll cry, and I'll beg, and I'll plead, until mom finally does what? Gives in and gives in the evil Knievel. Wind up. The real toys of Lash from the Past. But a lot of us are like that as church members. When we don't get our way, as we cruise down the toy aisle of church life, and we don't get our way, and we pitch this major fit. Pitch this major fit. Start getting on the ground, rolling around, screaming, crying, moaning, groaning. And it's funny, just like the little kid. That church member thinks that's the way I'm going to get things done. That's the way I'm going to get my way. Is I'll just make such a fuss about it, and I'll make everybody's life around me so miserable that they'll eventually give me my way at church. Can I get an amen? Now, do you think that's the way to go? Do you think if a church member does that, and you can see when church members do that, do you think that's a, that, that's a good look? Do you think, wow, I want to be like, like, wow, this person right here that's rolling around on the floor in church, fantastic. And that's how you get things done. Here's where the bullet comes in at Bartlett Hills. That subculture has been here so long. That subculture has been here so long that the idea is growing. 
that's how you get things done at Bartlett Hills. You whine about it. You gripe about it. You roll around the aisle. You make noise about it. You grumble and complain about it. So much so that whoever makes these decisions are going to change it and give it give you your own way. As if church was about you getting your own way. Some say, well, if I don't get my way, I'll just, I'll just take my ball and go home. And some have taken their ball and gone home because they didn't get their way. It's a bad look. It's worse than a bad look. It's wicked. It's evil. It's in the list of things you don't want to be involved with. But we just push that thing off as like, well, I'm just have strong opinions. No, you're just not full of the Holy Spirit. You're just acting like a jerk. Well, no, my mama told me to stand up for myself and push for what I want. No, you just have no cooth. You don't understand how relationships work. You're used to being the squeaky wheel. And the attitude has been fostered, and the subculture rolls on here at Bartlett Hills where the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the grease. And if I squeak long enough and loud and loudly enough, somebody will come along with some grease or some WD-40 and give me my way. I don't know about, maybe this is a shortfall in my character. I admit that right now. But when I feel that, when I feel that maybe from raising a certain someone who's getting married this Friday, or I feel that in a church member as a pastor, it makes me step back and say, there is no way I'm going to give you what you want. Unless the Lord just tells me, give them what they want. But if you're going to roll out of a selfish ambition and you're going to be the squeaky wheel and you're going to be that person who just is going to whine and moan and groan and when you don't get your way and take your ball and go home, cause dissension in the hallways, mumble and grumble on the phone, it does not encourage me to look favorably upon giving you what you want if it is in my, in my power to act in that particular way. Did it to you when, you when your kids acted that way? I know you're not my kids. I get that. Wow, what a Christmas party this would be at the house, right? But, but I'm just saying. Does that motivate you as a parent, mom and dad? Is that your motivating factor? My kid just whined and whined, screamed and screamed. Woo! And I gave them what they want. One bullet can be fatal. One bullet can be fatal. And then unconcerned, I'm going to speed up my pace a little bit because it's 2 o'clock. Verse 4, unconcerned. Each of you should, not, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let's face it, we're all good at looking after our own interests. We're all naturally built that way. But we're not so great at looking to the interests of others. The idea here is to think of preferential treatment. Right? That, no, you want one thing, I want the other. Here, you have your way. Preferential treatment. So that there should be, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25 and 26, so that there should be no divisions in the body, but that it, it, its parts should have equal concern for each other. Equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Pointing out, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. Question for you, what type of concession will you make to give your future brother and sister, the lost, the unchurched, and your current brother and sisters, those sitting around you right now, preferential treatment? What kind of concessions will you make? Or will you just be very rigid and say, no, I'm gonna, I want my own way? What type of concession will you make to reach the next generation? 
hey, by the way, you're sitting in a church. That doesn't mean you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but the majority of people in here are believers in Jesus Christ. What's your point? You've been reached. The church did what it did and had to do to reach your generation. And thank God that it did, right? How about baby boomers, right? Those of you who graduated in 1966, right on? In 86 and 96 and 2006. 2016. You've been reached. What concessions will you make to reach the next generation? Or are you just content with, no, 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 no. I, I want my own way. And I don't really care about the next generation. As long as I get my way, I'm cool. I'm okay, I'm happy. The next generation, they can go to another church that cares about reaching them, that will do what it takes to reach them. And hey, by the way, pull your chair up real close on this one. They will. Did you know? They will go somewhere else. They will go somewhere else. Maybe look around and maybe say they have gone somewhere else. What concessions will you make to reach the next generation? And what type of concession will you make to make every generation feel at home at Bartlett Hills? Young people, I want to ask you this. Youth in the room, I want to ask you this. 20s and 30s, I want to ask you this. What are you going to do to make the older folks feel at home, continue to feel at home? Bartlett Hills. Because we're a multi-generational church. I love that. I don't want to be a church with just a whole bunch of 23-year-olds sitting in church. That makes no sense to me. I love having a multi-generational church. But if we're going to fall into this, get duped into the strategy of being divided, old versus young, style versus style, and conquered, it'll be a church killer. It'll be a bullet to the brain for Bartlett Hills. What type of concession will you make to make every generation feel at home at Bartlett Hills? I remind you that one bullet can be fatal. Absolutely and no doubt. Last one, last one, attitude. Attitude, and that's really what this is about today, is about attitude, which leads to unity or attitude that leads to division. And I am speaking to the subculture. Once again, if you're asking, are you talking to me? If you're part of the subculture, I'm talking to you. If you're part of the subculture, I'm talking to you. You need to change your attitude. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Notice that. Notice the humility of Jesus Christ. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Notice Jesus Christ's humility and notice Jesus Christ's obedience to the Father. And that's quite frankly really all I'm asking for you today is for you to have the attitude of Christ, for you to humble yourself before the Lord, for you to change around your proud attitude subculture, and for you to be obedient to the Father in whatever attitude he's telling you to change. And it may be none of these. You may be like, this is not me, and I'm thankful for it. But the Lord may be speaking to you and saying, you know what, you really need to change this attitude. You've got to change this attitude. And he's speaking to you. And all I'm saying to you today is be obedient to him in that particular way. One bullet. Church killer. Don't let that be you. 
Don't be a homicidal church member. Don't be the killer, man. Don't be the one. Like I said before, that when it's all said and done, the history of Bartlett Hills looked back upon, and you are the one with the attitude that other people latched onto, and it killed Bartlett Hills. Let's go Philippians chapter 2 in our attitudes. So, wow, I was talking to niece and saying, you know what, niece? I'm not really sure how this invitation is going to go. I'm not even sure what type of invitation to give. Other than to go back to the beginning of the message and say this, if you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, even though you've been here basically your entire life, please do that today. He loves you. He wants to save you. If you are a believer, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, and you have areas of your life that you're holding back for yourself that you've not brought under his control and moved out of your life so the Holy Spirit can fill you with his Holy Spirit, there are other things in your life that are sinful taking up room, namely today one of these attitudes. I guess the invitation to you would be come down to this altar. Pray. And ask the Lord to change your heart. You can kneel down right by your chair if you choose to. You say, what do you think, I'm crazy? I'm not kneeling down right here in the middle of everybody. Okay, great. Stand up and pray. Lord, change my heart. Lord, change my heart. Well, Lord, do what you want to do. Lord, we look to your word for guidance and wisdom. We look to your word to see who you want us to be. Jesus, we want to be like you. And Jesus, we want to be a, a part of a church that is on the move for you, that you are using in a great way. And Lord, you are using Bartlett Hills. Lord, there are wonderful people Fact remains, the subculture remains. It's been here too long. It needs to get taken out. But I know that's going to happen because it's a work of your spirit and not me trying to talk someone into something. So, Lord, my prayer is would you do a supernatural work in each of our hearts? Because more than likely, on some level, we're all falling prey to one of these attitudes. Would you take it out, Lord? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I free trust him in his presence daily i
Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray, please. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings we receive on a daily basis. Lord, thank you for all the blessings that we receive.